due time. And uh, so if you're here, you know that you're on the block of Lightning Sessions. We're definitely in a treat to listen to Lightning Talks of all the award winners. So thank you for being here. And I see some of the award winners' faces around. You know that you have 10 minutes for your presentations. So the presentations are scheduled for eight minutes and two minutes for questions. And I'll be helping you to do that. And our first presenter, we are going to be uh, listening to the award winner for GRASPO. And I know that some of you heard a little bit about them earlier, and we are going to be able to hear a little bit more. So welcome. Um, so thank all of you uh, here after the lunch, um, and me being uh, one of the first to speak. Um, uh, and I uh, hope we'll have a very good afternoon. I'm very interested also in the, uh, the other award winners to see their presentations. Um, so as a um, short introduction, um, this is me five years ago uh, teaching at Erasmus University as a statistics teacher. Um, uh, actually, this is me outside. And uh, I really liked uh, teaching. Uh, this is uh, uh, us trying to learn about statistics to see if uh, people can taste the difference between normal Coke and Diet Coke. And sort of how many glasses would you need to take to actually sort of get some good evidence on can people do this. Um, and I really liked it, uh, at least the students said they also liked it, uh, but I also really struggled, to be honest, because there was a large uh, difference in prior knowledge. Um, and there was not enough time to actually do all these sort of fun activities while you also had to explain people what a mean or a median was. Um, so I started looking for online resources that I could use and some that I found were perfect and I could just use them, send a link. Uh, but for the exercises I had more trouble because sometimes I did find exercises somewhere but they were very hard to integrate in my lessons. So um, I, I struggled with that. And um, uh, I'm sl showing this slide for a, a reason that will come uh, clear later on. Uh, but I really like this idea of blended learning where you, you have online activities, offline activities, um, and um, here's a picture. And after lunch, I thought I'd do a short quiz. Who knows who this is? Newton? Yeah, perfect. Um, what's a, uh, a quote from Newton that may be uh, fitted in this uh, presentation? OK, perfect. So, exactly. Um, so the idea is you can build on the work of others, which of course in science, in open education is the idea. And so I, uh, five years ago I thought, okay, why, why, cannot we, why cannot we combine this, right? Well, that we, we actually can build on the shoulders of giants and that, we, uh, that I can just, I don't have to invent all these new exercises. Um, and that uh, became uh, uh, one of the, the sort of the core motivations to, to start Graspel. Um, and uh, maybe w what is the name? It's a merger of two words, to grapple, to struggle with something, and to grasp, to understand. So hopefully we can bring people from one to the other. And um, uh, what is Graspel? It is a collaborative authoring and practice platform for open, uh, open exercises, mainly focused on math and statistics. Um, so uh, very short, what we do is we help people uh, edit and create materials, um, create a course of learning um, uh, exercises, but also maybe some instructional material um, where students can practice and then teachers can see the, the insights on what people are still struggling with. Um, are students using this? Uh, this is an example from the Vrije Universiteit where uh, about 400 students uh, completed almost 200,000 exercises, so answers, in six weeks. So um, they use it a lot. Um, are they happy with it? Uh, uh, well, yes. Um, and uh, uh, this is just uh, some overall figures that you may have already seen in this morning if you were there. 12 million answers by about 30,000 students. And the exciting thing is uh, that today um, we released uh, about, or we're about to release, because we're now in the progress of releasing it, uh, uh, 2,400 exercises, uh, some created by us, some created by the universities that we work with. And that's the part that I want to focus on in this lightning talk. Um, because we, we now released, or we're, we're still releasing this in, in batches in the coming weeks, uh, but the idea is we really want to engage uh, the community as much as we can. So uh, the idea is, if you find, maybe, if you browse through it, because you, uh, you can just access it, if you browse through it um, and you see something where you think, oh, yeah, I would just really just do this differently, um, you can just click on uh, make a suggestion, you don't need to be logged in, um, and this is just a very easy way to send us an email so that we know we can improve things, or at least we can let the other people who created the materials know that we can maybe improve things. Um, just wanted to point that out. 
and this is um, uh, sort of, a, it visualizes the network and, and two institutions that I want to focus on um, because they made really this switch um, uh, to open exercises where they did not do, do that before uh, and where I think blended learning um, uh, is, is sort of made, made possible, that step. And the first is uh, the Technical University of Delft. Is there somebody in the room from Delft? I don't know, but um, uh, uh, w what is a very interesting thing is they really took an approach, uh, a blended learning approach, where they said, okay, students really have to uh, prepare during the lecture, participate, and in the end, practice. So that means how should they practice? Normally they practice from a book maybe, um, but they really wanted more interactive practice with more feedback so that uh, students would just learn more from the practice. Um, and then the question was, okay, but how shall we do that? We need a homework system, online homework system, what kind of a system? Um, and uh, finally, they decided to work with us, with Graspel, uh, used an, an integration, an LTI integration into their LMS, so students don't really know they're working with us, and that's fine. Uh, but they can use all the capabilities like a, a, a computer algebra system that we offer, so that if the answer would be 2x, but you answer x plus x, that it's automatically correct. Um, and the reason what I think is interesting is, is because they made that switch, and the question was now, okay, what do we want to do with those materials? Because th they said, we will cr create all of these materials uh, uh, ourselves. We will ask all of our teachers who has old exercises in their drawers and we'll start uh, uh, trying to get them online. And that is where we helped uh, them with. Um, and then the question was, okay, and what should the license be of this? And then the TU Delft said, okay, we have this new vision, all the materials by default uh, should be uh, Creative Commons license. So that was a, a great thing where we could now say, okay, and then we'll, we will help you, we will host this, uh, so that actually other people can also reuse it. Um, uh, so a, a first a se a selection of what they have created is already online, uh, but more will be coming uh, in the coming weeks and in the coming years probably. Um, the other one that I wanted to show is Utrecht University. Here's Kirsten. Um, she wanted to really uh, create uh, or, or sort of redo her, her education, um, uh, use more things in class. Um, and uh, I'm clicking through it a little bit faster. Um, but what they, um, what they did is they created a lot of materials, but they also used materials that we created, then said, OK, we'll do them a little bit differently. So they, they made changes. Um, and then we looked at those changes, and we thought, OK, these are actually better than what we created. So we sort of merged them back into our collection. And then a new university came and said, hey, we'll actually use those. Um, and, they, and they also looked at what uh, Utrecht created, uh, used those new creations, actually made new cr changes on top of that, and shared that back again. So this is, I think, where you really see this, this community working, uh, of creating exercises, sharing them, having other people improve it, sharing it back, um, and uh, where you can just use it. And um, now, always when I think uh, we are a social enterprise as Graspel, um, so I just wanted to, to tell you a little bit on, on how we work, because the idea is all the resources are openly available online. They are Creative Commons licensed, so you can just use them, reuse them, remix them. Um, uh, we will make sure that people can actually edit them. If, if you edit open materials, then that is also for free. Um, if you really want to use those materials with our software as, for example, an LTI integration in your sort of existing uh, software uh, offering or with, within your LMS, then we say, okay, apparently then you find it valuable um, and uh, uh, that is what we charge for so that we can keep the rest open. Um, now, this is basically my last slide and I have about 10 seconds, so I will keep this very short and just take one thing out of it. And that is what I think is interesting about blended learning is that if universities make that switch and if you have a system that is then very easy to use, uh, then we only have to convince people to say, okay, would you be willing to share at least part of those exercises online so that other people can find it? And what we found is, what is sort of that is the interesting moment where you can take people who are maybe not OER advocates at the beginning, uh, but maybe can become one in the process. Um, and if you want to know more about this term, I'll tell you later on. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and um, I hope you'll have a great afternoon. So, thank you, Marcela. Uh, buenas a tutti, buenas tardes a todos. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Open Education Consortium for granting us with this award. Uh, we are very, very happy and very proud to, to get this recognition that encourages us to, to keep working in the field of open education. 
Uh, in Spanish, we normally say that uh, lo bueno si breve, dos veces bueno. The good, if brief, is twice as good. So, as I only have uh, eight minutes for my presentation, I don't want to waste any single second, and I'm going to start talking to you about our different projects. Open Courseware, uh, uh, University of Cantabria has been creating Open Courseware since 2008, uh, expanding and improving our list of resources uh, every year. We have a wide variety of disciplines that we gather in six different uh, categories that are pure science, uh, humanities, health science, engineering, social science, and cross subjects. More or less all our courses have more or less the same structure, a main page with a, an image, and then we have syllabus, class materials, practices, exercises, texts, uh, exams, and information about the professor. Uh, although our courses are mainly published in, in Spanish, of course, uh, we have uh, also some courses like, like this in, in English. We started with only 10 courses, uh, with more enthusiasm than quality, I have to admit. But during these 11 years, we have uh, expanded and improved uh, our list of resources. And our repository currently offers uh, 238 courses. We are proud that almost all the departments of the university have uh, worked with us. Um, more than four, uh, 400 professors have published their courses with, with us. Our offer also includes two full degrees, nursing and mining. I have to say that it's not easy to fulfill the task to complete a full, a full degree because when you work with individual professors, normally they apply to participate, but when you want, when you want to create a full degree, Sometimes you have to force the professors to participate and it's, it's not easy to, to fulfill this, this task. Nowadays, OpenCourseWare University of Cantabria is one of the most visited uh, OpenCourseWare repositories. Uh, we have a Moodle-based platform and currently we have months with more than 400,000 uh, users in a single month. So I think it's a very, very, very good result. We're very happy. Uh, these visits come especially from Spain and Latin America due to the publication mainly in Spanish. And it's a great satisfaction for us to have so many people coming from Mexico, from Peru, Argentina or Colombia, and also uh, from the United States in the, in the late years. Uh, another area of open education that we are working in, uh, we are working in is MOOC. We have an agreement with the Spanish platform Miriada X, uh, that is the biggest MOOC platform in, in Spanish, and this platform gathers around 90 institutions. Since 2013, we have uh, created 21 courses with 80 different editions, and more than 500,000 students enrolled in our, in, in our different MOOCs. And in some cases, we have had completion rates bigger than 50% in some cases. And we are very, very happy with these results also. Uh, our latest MOOC is, is uh, also the most special one because we have created this MOOC in collaboration with uh, four European universities. And we have created a blended uh, learning experience uh, consisting um, firstly in a MOOC experience where all the, the students are invited to participate and then face-to-face uh, -face activities in each of the four universities. Uh, as you know, usually the contents in MOOC are free and accessible but not reusable, so they are not really open in many cases. This is not the case of the University of Cantabria because by default we use open licenses and we make it visible for the users. So it's not, it's not only important to, to use uh, open licenses but also to make it visible for the users because if not they don't know what they can or what they can't do. Uh, open Courseware and MOOC uh, are our biggest project, but in this speech I would uh, uh, like to talk also about a new project that we launched in 2018, that is our repository of teaching resources. This is a carefully selected and organized collection of external resources that serves to enhance teachers' knowledge on, on open education methodologies and improve their ability to create high-quality teaching materials and activities. Uh, this repository is constantly updated uh, to include the latest developments in each of its six categories. Application and services. This section contains application, websites, tools and services that may be useful for teachers, such as assessment tools, photo editors, uh, automatic translators, task managers, mind maps, etc. 
online courses uh, among the thousands of free and open online uh, courses available in the web. This is a curated selection of uh, courses that may be of general interest to teachers, uh, focusing particularly on topics such as office automation, languages or pedagogy. Educational conferences uh, and events. Education and innovation is a key issue at universities. And in this third category, we focus on important educational conferences and events, particularly those concerning educational innovation. And this is a category that we have to maintain continuously updated. Open educational resources. Uh, as you know, it's not, it's not always easy to find websites with open educational resources. So in this fourth category, we provide a large number of websites that have been published or promote the use of materials uh, with open licenses, such as uh, the Open Education Consortium, Khan Academy, or Internet Archive. Training in online teaching. In order to provide effective and high, and high quality online teaching, it's essential to be aware of the tools and resources that differentiate this, this type of education from face-to-face -face learning. Therefore, this section contains courses and video tutorials about online teaching. Repositories, this final section provides links to other websites where you can find open resources uh, presented in an organized and easy navigable manner, such as photographs, uh, music, video, data, etc. Each category uh, in our repository is divided into subgroups, which can be filtered using keywords, facilitating searches. Uh, and once you have, you have found the resource you need, uh, you have an image, you have a short description and a link to the original uh, resource. And finally, to complete our offer in open education, we publish a newsletter with the latest news uh, about uh, education innovation, open resources, events, etc. And we send it quarterly to all our professors. So, to sum up, uh, our motto is that open resources are not just necessary, but they must be also known and used. So, thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you. Any questions for Sergio? No questions for Sergio. Okay. So, we continue with Bill, um, our next presenter. Uh, enhancing OER Discovery with Oasis, they are the award winners for uh, curation, OER curation. Hello everyone, thank you so much for the uh, opportunity to speak before you, it's an honor and a privilege to, to be here. Um, my name is Bill Jones, I'm the Digital Resources and Systems Librarian at the State University of New York at Geneseo Milne Library, um, which is in the United States. Um, just so you have an idea of uh, where Oasis was born and where I come from, um, that's a picture of the State University of New York at Geneseo. Uh, we're at that red dot there that's in the Finger Lakes area of New York State. Um, so it's about a six hour train ride from the, from the um, New York City that you might be familiar with. Geneseo was funded in 1871, um, has fiercely lo loyal alumni as you can see at the bottom of that description. I am one of the alumni of SUNY Geneseo. Uh, we have 5,500 students and about uh, 380 faculty. Um, here's a, a screenshot of the homepage of Oasis, just so you have an idea of what we're talking about here. Um, it has a selection of 98 different sources, um, and you can see those at that link, um, but you can see them after the presentation because I want you to focus up here. <laughs> um, so, but the link is right there on the slides, and these will be posted as SCED at the end of this presentation. Um, just so you have an idea of how this resource was built, it was built from the ground up. Um, I am not a, a trained programmer, I'm a librarian and also an educator. Um, so the framework for this site was through PHP, MySQL, uh, Bootstrap 4, jQuery, HTML, CSS, and some JavaScript. Um, Oasis is hosted at SUNY Geneseo on our servers in a virtual machine. Um, and then the resources are pulled using Python scripts. Uh, Google Analytics is used to gather the usage statistics so we can have an idea of how many users are using um, this resource and where they're coming from. And development of this began in April 2018, and the site launched on September 5th, 2018. So just a couple months of development. And we went live um, on September 5th, 2018 with 52 sources and 155,000 resources. 
Um, so these are the tools that, you're, that were used to build it, and you may be wondering why there's a picture of the Sistine Chapel there. Um, just a couple days ago, I had uh, the privilege of taking a tour with, with my wife, and we were led by a nun um, to go and see the Sistine Chapel, and I got to quickly snap a picture, which you're totally not allowed to do, uh, but I was able to, to get that. It's mainly because, I guess, it creates heat, and it could uh, just create an issue with the painting. And I asked, I asked uh, Sister Emanuela, how did he get all the way up there? Like, because it's so high up. And she's like, well, he used scaffolding. I was like, oh, that's so obvious, right? Um, and it might be obvious to you, too, how it was built, but I just wanted to lay that out for you. So uh, Ultra Edit, Text Wrangler, and Brackets were used as text editors to write the code. Uh, FileZilla was used to upload the uh, images and other items to the server. Apple Terminal um, to do SSH and MySQL. Um, Adobe Photoshop to edit the images. Flat Icon and Font Awesome are used for icons, and GitHub is used as a code repository to, to host the code, not host it, but um, save it and see the iterations as we went forward. Um, and we also get by with some help with our friends, so Stack Overflow uh, was a very great resource for this because I'm not a trained programmer, so I had to ask a lot of questions about how to do these different things, same with various forums and guides, and strategic Google searches, and prayer because I needed a lot of help with this resource. Uh, Oasis features, um, it's single search, multiple word, or quoted phrase searching, which you might think, big deal, Google can do quoted phrase searching, right? But that's really difficult to build when you don't know what you're doing. Um, and I found a special regular expression for that. And um, advanced search by title, author, subject, source, and link. Um, you can begin your search just by format type. You can see here there's those four icons. Those are different material types that are on Oasis. Um, you can filter by type, subject, source, and license. You can refer a resource to a colleague via email, right from each of the individual items. Um, there's a sticky search bar on the top of every, every site, a page. Easy website issue reporting at the bottom. There's a way to report issues. Uh, <clears throat> you can suggest a source. So if you find a source that's not on Oasis, you can go ahead and recommend that, and we'll get that included. Um, and it has a crisp, clean interface. So here's an example search for geometry. You can see that um, there's three different items here, but a total of 148 different resources with a listing of the title, author, source, type, and license for that. That little mail icon is so you can mail it to your friends. And that little phone there is just to prompt you to contact your librarian if you need any help with the uh, OER resources. Um, this is an award-winning uh, search tool, as you know, because I'm standing up here and um, I was, uh, we were awarded the uh, OER Curation Award from the OER Consortium. Thank you very much and also the ACRL Award, which is a, a part of the American Library Association, um, Association of College and Research Libraries, College Library Section, Innovation and College Librarianship Award. That was awarded to Ben Rollins and I um, at the ALA conference in Washington, D.C. this year in June. Um, just so you have an idea of who's using this so far since the launch of September 5th, um, 2018, and these stats were pulled on November 17th, 2019. We'd have 44,000 users um, with over 57,000 sessions and 214,000 page views with about 100 users a day. Um, we almost have every country that has at least visited this site. Uh, mainly it's being used in the US, but we've had 143 different countries using Oasis. And some of the updates since the release, um, we now have a detailed item view for some of the items. You can search within the results, so if you have a result set, you can search within that result set to even funnel down your results further. Um, you can share the link to the results, so you can share your entire results set with a colleague. You can do a voice search um, instead of typing your search in. We've updated the home page. We've added 47 new sources with 213,000 new records, and there's now a list of all the institutions that have embedded Oasis on their uh, library libguides or institution website. So here's an example of the detailed item view. That's available if the detail is available as part of the item. So if it's not available, we're not manually writing those in. It's just part of the automatic scrape. That's the search within results button. So you could do your initial search right in the gray box and then um, funnel that down by searching even further into that. Um, and here, if you click that button there, you can share that link and it'll bring it right to the, uh, the search results that you saw. There's the voice search for, and it only works for Google Chrome because it uses Google Translate in order to, uh, to do that. Um, here's the update on the left. That's what the home site used to look like, and we've uh, changed it to this glossier version. Um, here's an idea of how many institutions are using it. So 493 institutions have embedded Oasis into their website, and there's a full listing at that blue link down at the bottom. You can see exactly where on their sites that they've listed this. Um, 
I don't think that I have time to go through all of these enhancements, but we would like to dedupe some of the results list, enhance the advanced search, um, and then allow it indicate for you, um, you know, what, are, what is being used in the classroom, just so people have an idea of what resources are most useful um, to instructors. If you want, you can go ahead and embed this on your li library website uh, right away. It's free. Um, if you go to that link, the source code for the widget is right there, and you can just pop it into your LibGuide or your, your uh, institution's site. And um, just thank you so much for, for your time and attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, any questions for Bill? Or is this one question here? Hi, so thanks for your presentation. It uh, looks very impressive. The platform, 52 different repositories. 98 now. 98, sorry. Yeah, well, even more impressive then. Um, Thank you. What I'm wondering is, uh, how do you go about all the different metadata formats that are used in all these different platforms? Because you want to uh, show users something coherent, but all these different platforms have all types of different metadata standards, right? So how do you go about that? Um, so the original schema that we used was um, based on Dublin Core metadata standards, and then we just simplified that down to about 15 different fields. And then each of the scrapers is unique to each source. So it will scrape those particular fields and then insert that information into the table where it's applicable to that field. So that it's quite imp so the, 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 a search query, does it, how much time does it take to perform a search query? That sounds like this, this, this should take minutes <laughs> or... Um, so if you're doing a search on, uh, on your own and you're doing it with this original data set with uh, 368,000 records, it should take about one to two seconds to search through it. Um, I loaded it with about a million resources just to do a test, like, is it going to break, right? Um, and it took about four seconds, so I need to get a little smarter about, you know, how to optimize searching, but um, currently it takes about one to two seconds. In that case, I really want to speak to you afterwards. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Marcella. Um, yeah, and of course, uh, the purpose of having these lightning talks today is to, give, to know that we still have another day tomorrow, and you can, of course, reach out to any of the winners t later today or, or tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. And And we continue with our speedy day. Oh, and one thing that I forgot to tell our winners, uh, we would like to take a picture of all of you together. So if at the end you would be able, able to join us, we would love that. And, uh, well, James, upload his presentation. Okay, so our next presenter, it's uh, Open Course, James Glapa Grosklein. Hi, everybody. Uh, <laughs> uh, shout out to Oasis, really. Where, where did Bill go? Really, it's, it's definitely one of the go-tos for my team, so. Yeah, really, we, we definitely use it. Uh, anyways, I'm going to be a lot less technical. I'm not going to talk about search results in two seconds or four seconds, and I, I don't have any slides. So I'm going to talk to you about maybe five minutes or so. Um, I want to speak about a uh, course that uh, we, we're offering in my context to help, uh, to help practitioners, academics, program managers, learning designers better understand how open educational resources helps us in education to achieve the why, the bigger why. So my context is California Community Colleges. Um, we are open access, open enrollment institutions. We proudly accept the top 100% of our applicants. Uh, in California, we have about 100, well, we have exactly 114 community colleges serving over 2 million students every year. Uh, and during the past few years, we've seen a big shift or change from adopting and implementing open educational resources in individual courses to creating entire degree pathways so that students can start and finish their entire education without ever touching commercial products. Uh, in the United States, we refer to this idea or this concept as Z degrees. In Canada, I, don't know, I think Rajiv left. In Canada, they refer to it as Z cred, and uh, Rajiv's uh, institution, KPU, uh, does that up in Canada. Terry's out there. Uh, so hopefully, it's going to spread uh, across Canada as well. Uh, in the California community colleges, we refer to these as ZTCs or zero textbook cost degrees. So a lot of different acronyms, a lot of different terminology out there. But again, the concept is that from the start, 
to the finish, students can complete their entire pathway, their entire program without ever touching commercial product. So uh, this course that I'm going to talk about, and I trust I'm going to look at it, Marcel, I trust the link is, the links to the courses are with the announcement on the website so you can find them and download them. They're in Canvas Commons. Uh, the course that we created was designed, again, to help academics understand, better understand how uh, open educational resources and Z degrees or zero textbook costs. Now Rajiv's back. I just gave a shout out to KPU while you're out of the room. Uh, so also Z creds in Canada. Uh, so to better understand how these ideas that we care so deeply about can help uh, institutions to better achieve the bigger picture, the bigger why. In the context of the United States, the bigger why is reducing equity gaps or reducing achievement gaps. This uh, really uh, terrible situation our students face in the United States whereby uh, the way in which you are born, the economic class in which you are born, the color of the skin, your gender, uh, really determines the likelihood of you completing an education. Uh, so there's a big movement in the United States. We're trying to, trying to change that so that the color of your skin and your gender does not predetermine your ability to succeed in education. Uh, so how, how can we use OER to change this equity gap uh, to reduce, reduce those gaps that we see in achievement? So the course uh, was designed uh, to be offered to academics, learning designers, program managers. It was designed by my good friend and colleague, Aloha Sargent with Cabrillo College. I had a, a kernel of an idea that she actually uh, implemented. Um, the course uh, is an open course, CC by license. It's on Canvas Commons. You can download it, implement it. It's a completely online course that, has, that consists of four modules to be completed in four weeks. There's a self-paced version. There's a facilitated version. Uh, and the four modules consist of the following. During the first module devoted to equity, we look at that big question of equity gaps. Why do the equity gaps exist? Uh, what does all the research tell us about, again, the color of your skin, the gender, the economic class? What kind of an impact does that have on your chances to succeed? And how can we change our lens, change our perspective in higher education from blaming the students for what they don't understand to retooling and reshaping our institutions so that our institutions can uh, approach students from where they are and help lead students to where they need to, get, need to go. Uh, the second module then uh, looks into OER, and it's not a how to do OER module, but rather it's, the, it's research on the efficacy of open educational resources, demonstrating and really integrating uh, a lot of the research that many of us here know, and I think we'll have to update this based on so much of the good research that's being presented at this conference, uh, the research that increasingly and convincingly demonstrates that when OER is implemented, the success of all students goes up, particularly the success for students of color go up, minoritized students, students from lower socioeconomic classes goes up, uh, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, we see a, a lot of that research out there, so we, we dive into that research in the second module on the efficacy of OER. The third module is devoted to a concept that is, that is a part of an educational reform movement in the United States called Pathways or Guided Pathways, which aims to smooth out many of the uh, overwhelming choices that students face uh, in U.S. higher education. In, in the past couple of decades, we've done a really good job of opening the door and bringing more students into uh, community colleges and the open enrollment institutions, but we still are not doing a very good job of getting students out successfully. We tend to provide students with too many choices, too many options. Uh, the students who are least prepared to succeed and make choices are presented with the most choices. Which courses do you want to take out of a a menu of 10,000 psychology courses or 10,000 history courses uh, in order to get out of here uh, in a timely fashion. The Pathways Movement is designed to smooth out some of those choices, in some cases eliminate some of those choices so that there's a faster way in and out. Uh, the final module uh, looks at uh, the concept of Z degrees, Z cred, zero textbook cost degrees, uh, demonstrating uh, that if you want to uh, reduce equity gaps by implementing OER and do it in a cohesive, orderly fashion. The only logical conclusion is to move your entire institution 
towards building degree pathways around OER so, again, students can complete their entire education without ever touching commercial product. Uh, again, the course is uh, fully online, four, four modules designed to be completed in four weeks. There's both a facilitated version and a self-paced version, openly licensed in Canvas Commons. If you utilize Canvas, you can search for ZTC Equity or ZTC Pathways. And again, Marcella has the link on the announcement of the award. Uh, if you're interested in a facilitated version, I'd love to talk to you. Aloha and I would be very happy to, to chat with you or your institution about a facilitated version. But again, the self-paced version is out there. Thanks very much. Any questions for James? No questions for James, okay. We invite Dave Dillon, please go ahead, Dave. Uh, it's our Open Textbook Award winner for this year. Greetings. Good afternoon. I'm Dave Dillon. I'm a counselor and professor at Grossmont College in San Diego, California, uh, not far from James's school. And um, I'm truly honored and humbled uh, to win an award. Um, I'd like to share a little bit with you about, um, about the project. So I, I originally intended to curate uh, three college success OERs, one for a study skills and time management class, one for a career decision making class, the third for an all encompassing, um, more of a first year experience uh, class for students. And the, and the first thing I want to share with you is that this was certainly not a solo project. Um, there was collaboration every step of the way, and I really think that's what open education is all about. Um, so if you see some form of this picture throughout the slides, that's, that's where collaboration took place. Um, special thanks to four mentors. I sought out to um, find people that knew more than I did when I started. There were a lot of things that I didn't know, um, some things I didn't know that I didn't know. And so I was very fortunate to find four people who were willing to volunteer their time to nurture me, to answer my questions, um, to help me when I got stuck, Two are here at Global, uh, James, who just spoke, and Una, who is here at the conference. Um, I'm indebted and, and have great gratitude uh, for them. Um, so the platform, you're all familiar with Pressbooks. Uh, the publisher, Rebus, um, I received support from my colleagues, administrators, um, faculty, uh, the open community, uh, my mentors, reviewers, volunteers, uh, the support was really endless, um, and, and my family supported me uh, as well. And then there was a little bit of funding. This originally was a sabbatical project, so I was being paid my salary uh, for one semester to try to put this together. Um, it ended up taking close to three semesters, um, so some of that ended up being, being unpaid. There was also, James spoke about the zero textbook cost grant in California. There was a little bit of that money that got pushed towards copy editing. Um, the rest was a labor of love, as they say. Um, so these are the original authors. My work uh, ended up being a remix because I was able to find high quality, uh, previously peer-reviewed uh, college success OER that was already out there. And so it was uh, nice to have a buffet style. I like this, I'm gonna use this. Um, maybe I'm gonna take some of this and, and some of that and put it all together. Um, I do wanna point out specifically that I I was looking for uh, women authors, and so three of the five original authors, authors are women. Um, I was also looking for persons of color and, and being able to use their voices. And the um, Foundations of Academic Success, Words of Wisdom text um, that Thomas Priester edited and is from the same uh, system as, as Bill is from, um, the State University of New York. Um, it's a collection of essays from a wide variety of, of people. Um, many of those are people of color, many of those are women. Um, it, it, it has student essays, administrative essays, faculty essays, classified essays, and it's a really wonderful um, 
collection that, that really resonates with students because they're sharing their experience wherever they were at the time. Um, and students really, really uh, grasp that. Um, I think it comes across the page as more of a casual conversation rather than um, a textbook that's talking at a student. Um, this, uh, I hope you are, are not too young to, to not be able to recognize. Um, this is my best example to share with someone outside of open as to what I was trying to do. This is a, a remix. So when I started talking about remixes in the Creative Commons world, those that weren't uh, educated about the licenses had no idea what I was talking about. When I used this analogy, it was like they got it. Um, so I say, I was remixing a textbook the same way that you might remix something that you were going to give to somebody else, except the way that I'm doing this is legal. <laughs> um, and this is how I felt like the project was going at many moments, um, specifically because I had never done it before. I didn't know if it was going to be successful. Um, and, and while there are great benefits with remixes, there are also some, some heavy challenges, specifically uh, consistency. Consistency with voice when you have multiple authors, consistency with attribution when different people are putting together attributions in different ways, um, and consistency with style. Um, so uh, I was afraid that I might end up with this Frankenstein invention. I'm, I'm very pleased that it ended up being fairly smooth. Um, I will also share two what I would call victories for the open community regarding relicensing. Um, there were two works that I wanted to use that were originally uh, CC BY, share alike, and non-commercial. Um, I did something as simple as send an email and, and said, hey, look, I'm trying to put this together. I would really like a universal CC BY license. I would like to use your work. Um, it would be complicated for downstream users if I have different licenses with my work. Would you be willing to consider relicensing your work? I laid out some more of the benefits, much to my surprise and, and happiness immediately. Um, both of those, those authors got back to me and said, yes, we will relicense our work. So i um, very pleased about that. Um, indebted to my mentors as well as the reviewers. This was a very scary process for me because um, it was a blind review, and I wasn't sure. <laughs> I think if, if you're used to seeing the comments that some people um, put into general blogs or things that are out in the internet, it's, it's cause for concern. Um, however, this was an extremely positive process and um, absolutely raised the level of quality of the work with the feedback that I'd gotten from the reviewers. Um, I'm, I'm humbly sharing that the, the, the main text is now being used in about 25 colleges and universities, mostly in the United States. Um, 15 California community colleges have adopted, um, and now that there is a, an adoption in Canada, I can say that there's international adoption, um, and, and hopefully that will continue to grow. Uh, it's also in a few high schools. Uh, the most common question that I get now is, hey, I'm really interested in adopting this, do you have any ancillaries? Which, when I was putting the work together originally, I was not, that was not on my radar. Um, we soon figured out if, if we do have ancillaries, that will make the adoption process easier. So um, there were some instructors that were early adopters and, and I got together and we started to put together these ancillaries. So now we have PowerPoints, uh, those are completed. Test bank is completed. Um, we're working on a potential conference for instructors that are using the text. There's a post-publication cultural competency chapter that's been added. Um, again, collaboration with SUNY. Um, we're working on an audio version. Students recorded their voices reading a chapter, um, and, and we're really excited about that because I think students are going to really like the peer um, voices. And then, Marcella, you're on my list for me to reach out to ask. Um, we'd like to start to put together a Spanish version. If, if any of you would like to collaborate or have leads for me to try to put that together, um, I would love to hear. Um, there are two adaptations that, are, that I'm excited about because I think other folks may, may help make, make it better and then they could reshare that and I could take their work. Um, we, we're all helping. Um, really quickly, I wanna share two stats that just 
jump off the chart. Um, thank you. Because I, 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 I thought our institutional research made a mistake. The, the, the number of A's, the percentage of A's, and the, the decrease in withdrawals, um, it's a very small sample. This was with my first four sections um, in using OER in comparison to the last 10 years of non-OER. And so I think it's a bit of a no-brainer to say, now that you all have the text, why wouldn't you do better? Um, and and I, I don't think that, while the, the, it may be higher in, in my case, it's, it's certainly not alone. We're seeing that, um, we're seeing those statistics everywhere. This is uh, what the front cover looks like. And um, thank you for being a wonderful audience. Thank you, Dave. Uh, any questions for Dave? One question. What is the student feedback regarding your um, book? So the, of course they love it, right? They, they do love it, thank you. Um, the students that are um, courageous enough to be able to comment on um, financial hardship will privately come to me and say, thank you you have made such a difference because I wouldn't have been able to afford the text otherwise. Um, other students will say, I'm going to give this to my brother or sister because I found it so valuable. Never before did they say that with a commercial textbook. And, and I wouldn't say it's solely because it's commercial. It has a little bit to do with access. I think it has a lot to do with the quality. Thanks for your question. Thank you, Dave. And we continue um, with the rest of our presentations. Um, now with Open MOOC with um, Sarah Richard and Adeline Bosu. Welcome. Hello everyone, I'm Sarah and this is Aline. We are from the association uh, PhDuc, which is a contraction of PhD and MOOC. Uh, we come from France and first of all, we would like to thank the Open Education Consortium for giving us uh, the Open Education Awards that allows us to present our project, the MOOC PhD and Career Development. So at this, the beginning of this project, there was another MOOC um, produced by the, the European project ECHO. The goal of this project was to teach people how to produce open education resources thanks to a social MOOC, the MOOC Step by Step. Aline was a coordinator of this MOOC and I was a participant. At that time, I was a PhD candidate and I wanted to explore what career possibilities I had and also how to be prepared uh, for that. And I also realized that I was not the only one with these questions. So as a participant of this, uh, this MOOC step-by-step, uh, step, I wrote the first draft of, uh, of our project. We met Aline and I virtually, and we uh, co-founded the association PhDoc. Two months later, it was the first iteration of the MOOC PhD and career development. Since then, we achieved uh, three iterations on different um, platforms, uh, open open source platforms, which uh, with a major improvement and update between each uh, iteration. And we are preparing the fourth iteration uh, will be in uh, January. Uh, the MOOC is made of five units. Uh, we also organize a live web conference and a challenge uh, each week to promote the, the community and to animate the community. And the participant can collect badges uh, by succeeding in the evaluation. Uh, each, um, each unit is made of several nuggets that contain uh, text and video, and we also add links to external materials, but we mainly focus on collaborative activities uh, because it's a central part of the MOOC, which is based on social constructivism. 
So uh, we encourage participants to create and share resources, um, and it makes each iteration unique. So we benefit from the support of a growing number of partnerships, so mainly universities, doctoral schools, but also experts and associations. And we also um, won an award from the French uh, Ministry of uh, Research. So uh, one of our main goal uh, is to, from the beginning, is to develop as much as possible the community, also to help isolated PhD candidates. So for that, we uh, propose some activities. First one, for example, uh, was the thread of discussion on the MOOC forum. And uh, it's a place uh, where the magic happens and where we like to spend a lot of time. Um, another activity participants uh, like is a peer-to-peer -peer activity. Uh, they are making the evaluation very seriously with a good and positive feedback uh, in a good mindset. And um, sorry, <laughs> and uh, they 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 know that they are learning and improving from each other. We also propose a wall where uh, participants can post their resources, so it's collaborative uh, wall. And also, we uh, invite them to make a collaborative guide, like um, a co-created deliverable, deliverable of the MOOC. And all of these uh, resources are still available after the MOOC. So we take uh, advantage of the international community because uh, the MOOC is proposed both in English and in French, and so participants come from all over the world. We benefit also from uh, in, uh, diversity because the MOOC is open to everybody and to PhD, uh, uh, PhD candidates and PhD uh, graduates, and we take care to mix uh, domain. Uh, to uh, keep uh, the community active, we, have, we use uh, social media and especially the LinkedIn group uh, to stay uh, alive after the MOOC also, and it's working uh, well. So today we are proud to present uh, our results. Um, after three iterations, we have uh, uh, 6,400 participants, and as you can see, uh, all the activities are uh, very uh, well uh, done by the participants. So uh, how we make all these things possible? We share the animation between uh, us, so the volunteers from the association PhDook, and the participants. So we created different uh, roles among the participants, especially a Nick Lehrer uh, role, which can be translated by e-supporter, uh, but also a MOOC community manager, which helps to coordinate the e-supporters. And their role is to promote the discussion and the interaction between the participants. We also have uh, experts uh, who help us on the web conferences and uh, they can answer directly the, the question of the participants. Uh, so to recap, uh, our strengths are that we achieved three uh, iterations. Uh, we show that we, are, we were able to adapt the content uh, to the participants' needs and to collect the feedback of the participants, we use a thread um, that we open at the end of the MOOC to collect that feedback, and also an exit survey, uh, where they can also uh, send us their, their feedback, and we, saw that, we see that uh, the, they are pretty uh, satisfied with, uh, with the content. So now, what are our next uh, challenges? Uh, we would like to keep going with a team of volunteers because we want to uh, keep our status of non-profit association, which is quite challenging by itself. Um, we would like to develop internationally and to keep improving uh, the MOOC between each iteration. So we have three lines of thinking, uh, how to make the system more self-managed, how to improve the support of, of the participant, and how to promote interaction between the participants. Uh, and now we are thinking of a few projects to address these uh, questions, and we are trying to develop them for the next iteration, which we will start on January. Uh, so we will be uh, glad to discuss about them with you all and to collect also your ideas and feedbacks. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah and Adeline. Questions for Sarah and Adeline? No questions. Well, they, they will stay with us the rest Thank of the you. conference. Thank you. 
And now we invite uh, Terry, Terry Green. He's gonna uh, open pedagogy award winner. Um, I can go to the internet, right? Have that here? Yeah. Not gonna go slideless like James. What a power move that was. <laughs> um, where's the slash? Sorry. This keyboard is different than my normal one. <laughs> where's this? <laughs> Got it. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for having me here. My name's Terry Green. I am the digital learning advisor at Fleming College, which is a community college in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. About an hour northeast-ish, do you want me to smile for that one? Of uh, Toronto, which is everyone's standard understanding of what's in Canada. So the open patch books, there's, there's two of them, and we call them Community Quilts of Learning. And here's the equation of how it works. We take a list of uh, topics. Um, for the faculty patchbook, we um, had uh, a list from the University of Michigan, these high level practices, uh, high leverage practices of teaching, like how to run a discussion, how to, how to manage group work, how to form your assessments, and said, who wants to pick that one and write your take on how that happens? And then if you collect enough stories from enough people about how they do their teaching, you have a quilt, you have something that covers not everything, but, but the bigger it gets, the more it covers everything. With the goal to say here, um, new faculty and, and older faculty, here's a book on how to teach college written for you by your peers. So we thought that was a pretty cool idea. So here's a look at the, the first one was the Open Faculty Patchbook. Those two URLs, there's, there's two sites for them. Um, the openfacultypatchbook.org is a WordPress that we, we use basically like a blog. So if a new patch comes in, it's posted there right away. So it just grows from there. We're up to 37 or something. Um, the press book is, and it works slick. Usually when you have an idea of how something works with technology, and, and you don't actually try it out until you need it, it, it totally fails. And it, I thought, I know WordPress books is built on WordPress, it'll be fine, it'll work, and it totally worked perfectly. So kudos, Pressbooks, it works just like you said it did. Took everything out of the WordPress, popped it into Pressbooks to form that um, printable and book-like uh, textbook for teaching for faculty. Um, and printed it out for uh, a Fleming College hired about 17 new faculty that year. It was in, into the fall, so we had them for them, and they thought that was pretty cool. But also what we really enjoyed was collecting these stories, not just from Fleming College, but from anywhere. Um, they come from universities, they come from other colleges in Ontario, in the States. Um, I was lucky enough to get a couple contributions from Mahabali in, um, in Cairo um, in, and, and in Europe. Uh, we're missing the Global South, though, so I'd love to get there. Um, and that's the great thing. Uh, I'm going to collect these stories forever, so if, if anyone's interested, send me a story. And that's another thing, sorry. Um, I thought people would come back with a, like, here's how I do discussions, step one, step two, step three. No, it was like telling us stories about who their students are and, and the context and, and why they've done everything. So it was very personal stories um, with some advice, and I just really liked it. And, and people totally abandoned that list because they had their own great and better ideas for what to write about. And then after a while, I realized, I have five more minutes, 
be as obvious as possible with you that, okay, I'll, I'll miss it. Um, thank you. Um, I realize you, if you're an instructor teaching to 30 students, you're instructing your way, and the students are learning 30 different ways, so we need to hear their stories. So I found um, a uh, open textbook about university success, which, sorry, who was just up two ago? Did you use that one from University of Regina as well, university success? Okay, so I just took the list from that and said, take it from there, and they said, no, I'll, we'll, we'll give you our own stories, cause, and it's a great list, but, um, so I got awesome stories, just basically how I get my reading done, how I get my writing done, um, but then there were great stories about, um, and they came from all over, um, about bullying, I didn't realize it still happens in, in university and college, about coming out, about um, just wonderful stories, and I want to, um, it's harder to, to find these stories because I'm not in the student world. I'm in the, the um, faculty um, educator world. But um, the more we get of these, we'll, the better. And there's only one URL because uh, I've never, I've got, haven't got to the point to move it to a press book yet. I'm not sure if, if it's, they're, they're very, they seem very different beasts, these things. So here's where the idea came from. And I'm, I'm pretty sure this, is, this might be the most, in my opinion, legendary open educational resource there is because it took it to the next level. It's an open educational resource built with the students, co-created with the students, and it, it, it like supercharged the open pedagogy. And it, I saw Robin DeRosa speaking about it in uh, 2016 at the Open Education Conference, and I was just like mind blown and, and immediately thought, let's do this for, for faculty development, and that's what brought me to um, talk about it, or use it, uh, use the patchbook, create the patchbook. Okay, so when I knew I was coming here for a five minute lightning talk, which I have, what, three minutes left or something? I asked the, you know, um, I only asked the um, faculty ones, because th those are the only ones I could get a hold of, um, what convinced you to add to the quilt? So here, are, I'm just gonna par PowerPoint karaoke here for you. I love the idea of peer-to-peer -peer sharing of ideas and different strategies and methods for teaching and resource design. I learn so much and find so much inspiration in the different reasons that people choose open and use open. If I want to be inspired, then I need to embrace sharing my ideas without fear. And I think the patchbook was an easy way to, to ease your way into open publishing of your thoughts about pedagogy because there are other people there with you. I had something I thought was worth sharing and considered others might learn from my experience. My experience in the classroom was the deciding factor. I saw a strange disconnect between our culture and good pedagogy, and I wanted to address it and work through my ideas on paper. Two minutes, thank you. The desire to collaborate with other faculty on the development of an open education resource, that this resource would be accessible to a broader community of teaching and learning and would connect me to faculty I would otherwise not have an opportunity to engage with. Awesome. And this was the real reason that people wrote them. Most people said this, something, or something along the lines of my nagging, good-natured nagging, they said sometimes, was, uh, was the reason they actually put something in, so that I would leave them alone. So, uh, this is totally self-serving. I want more. Give me more, please. That's my Twitter handle and my email. Um, just come talk to me if you can't get this, or you get an image. Uh, and I've, I've been debating whether to say this, but at some point I think if there's someone out there who would like to take the reins for one of, the, for one of these, I'd love to, to hear it, because um, maybe a, a, fresh, a fresh look would be cool. So if, if you're interested in taking over, let's talk. So thank you very much. Do I have more time? Let's just sit silently for a minute. Okay, okay thanks. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. A question for Terry? Someone? We're good. Well, he will be around. Thank you, Terry. <laughs>